Dark Madeline is a part of her. And I think, uh, especially the way that she echoes a lot of Madeline's, like, inner fears or inner thoughts, and she sort of uh, exemplifies the way that she doubts herself. And I think that that was very relatable for me as someone who can look back and be like, oh, (laughs) hey, imposter syndrome, how y'all doing? When I first played Celeste, I was struck by its genuine, heartfelt depiction of mental health struggles. It didn't change my life, but I found Madeline's struggles with her intrusive thoughts, self-doubts, and anxieties compelling, far more than I would have expected from a genre most known for Goomba stomping and Adult Swim gore comedy. I felt I could relate to Madeline, and maybe even to the writer who crafted her story. Right up until one specific moment. A moment that put a pit in my stomach, and after which I dismissed Madeline's story as trite, or possibly even demeaning. It wasn't until much later that I realized I had made a tragic mistake. I'm the Talking Skull, and I'd like to discuss the challenge of writing stories about mental health, and the pain of being misunderstood, mischaracterized, and marginalized. Depression and anxiety are complicated topics. You can talk to a hundred people who've sought therapy for depression or anxiety and get a hundred different descriptions of what exactly they needed help with, how their symptoms manifested, and what they got out of therapy. Sometimes people's mental health suffers from financial strain, sometimes romantic trouble, poor parenting, post-traumatic stress, or any number of other factors. And sometimes it's a physiological problem with no external root cause. To complicate it further, there's a slew of symptoms that can manifest in all different forms and severities. But too often, stories about mental health come across as boiling all of mental illness down into a very simple box. You see, people who tell stories about mental illness generally don't want to end on a downer note that leaves audiences, many of whom may be struggling with mental health themselves, feeling hopeless. So there's a tendency for these stories to conclude with some kind of positive message about how to overcome or manage your mental illness. The unintended consequence is that stories about mental illness can come across as belittling, like with the ambitious but ill-fated Depression Quest. Yes, I am going to talk about Depression Quest on the internet in 2023, but unlike most of the people who talked about this game, I actually played it. Depression Quest pulls a neat trick by showcasing how depression bars you from the obviously healthy actions that would improve your life by crossing those actions out of your list of choices. You might know what you should do, but what you should do and what you can do may not line up. For me, though, this mechanic fell on its face, because it's too simplistic and transparent. If you always know what all your options are, and you know exactly what you can and can't manage at any given point, it's easy to just pick the best available option that you can manage. String together all of those least worst options, and you quickly win. You did it. You beat depression. Of course, reality is neither that clear nor that easy. You can't always know in advance what you'll be able to manage. Sometimes you pick the best option, but it's too much and you lose control. Sometimes you desperately try to do the right thing and you just can't. Often, you don't even understand all your options. And all of that compounds with the plentiful struggles of normal life, leading to devastating spirals. Your depression causes you to lose a job, which puts your ability to pay rent into question, which makes you even more depressed, which makes finding a new job harder, which feeds into your depression catastrophizing, and the spiral gets out of control. By portraying the solutions to mental health issues as easy or straightforward, games can unintentionally belittle people who struggle with mental health, while making their problems seem less serious than they actually are to a neurotypical audience who might be learning about mental health through that story. But there's another problem. 
With so many different forms of mental illness and so many symptoms and treatment methods, there is no one-size-fits-all solution to all of mental illness. Compound this with stories that wrap their topic in layers of metaphor and you get a whole bunch of mentally ill people reading their own completely different experience into the story, then disagreeing with the resulting implied conclusions because their struggle doesn't actually match the real-life struggle the storyteller was trying to express, beyond the surface-level metaphor. This is what happened with me and Celeste. See, for most of the story, Dark Madeline can be seen as a straightforward allegory for intrusive thoughts caused by depression and anxiety. Dark Madeline harasses Madeline, tells her she's worthless, that she's wasting her effort that she can't do the things she set her mind to. I've been there. I've experienced the kind of self-sabotage that can, as a totally random example, cause someone to drop out of college because they no longer believe they have the talent to pursue the dream that they had previously been determined to achieve. So it hurt when Celeste implied that what I needed to do was actually listen to my intrusive thoughts. That really, they had something important to tell me, and if I would just accept them, I could become better than ever. For me, this is not how managing depression looked at all. I resented being told to just listen to my intrusive thoughts more. You know, the ones my therapist literally described as unhelpful thoughts. My depression was not a result of some hidden part of myself that I had suppressed or neglected. Instead, it came from growing up with an emotionally abusive parent, whose constant anger and derision formed the foundation for my inner monologue. Overcoming that meant realizing the instinct to constantly put myself down, to doubt myself at every turn and deny myself any sense of accomplishment, was not an intrinsic, unalienable part of my being but simply a bad habit, taught over two decades worth of poor parenting. A habit that, with newfound understanding, discipline, and time, I could unlearn. I could acknowledge these intrusive thoughts and simply let them go. So this conclusion to the Dark Madeline character, this idea that those unhelpful thoughts are actually super helpful if only you would listen to them, well, it felt misguided, and more than a little trite. And then, Matt, the developer of Celeste, came out as Matty. In 2020, I was not plugged into the trans scene. I was all for anyone doing whatever makes them happy, but I didn't really know what being trans entailed. It was only after learning about Maddie's transition, and from the transition of one of my closest friends, that I started to understand what dysphoria can be like, and how it can affect your mental health, manifesting as, among other things, depression. The most obvious cue for Dark Madeline as an allegory for gender dysphoria, aside from the trans flag easter egged into the ending, is the running theme of mirrors. Mirrors and reflections are a powerful, obvious symbol for anyone struggling with gender identity. The idea of finding common ground between who you feel yourself to be and who you see in the mirror is a powerful, positive message for anyone who can't find in the mirror those traits they most feel within themselves. But Dark Madeline, importantly, is not what Madeline actually sees in the mirror. She's what Madeline dreams of seeing in the mirror. Madeline hates Dark Madeline on sight, hurling insults right away while Dark Madeline is still friendly and patient. Madeline doesn't want to admit who she wants to be, to the point that it's tearing her apart and holding her back. Those themes will feel familiar to anyone who's experienced any crisis of identity, or who has ever closeted themselves. Madeline also struggles with her self-image in other, smaller ways, like her dislike of photos and calling herself not photogenic. Later, the mirror theme even gets remixed, with something much darker manifesting from Madeline's self-hatred, in the form of a very literal interpretation of Madeline's anxiety about how she's perceived. And of course, Dark Madeline's mechanical significance is obvious. Madeline flees from this version of herself she rejects, and only fails at climbing the mountain due to her denials of self and inability to keep her other identity neatly bottled up. 
She only truly succeeds when she realizes that Dark Madeline should not be bottled up, and unlike my intrusive thoughts, cannot be simply let go, no matter how hard she tries, even flipping from being chased by Dark Madeline to chasing Dark Madeline instead. Only by embracing all aspects of herself can she truly succeed. For the bulk of Celeste's development, Maddie had not yet started her transition. She didn't know that some of her depression and anxiety stemmed from dysphoria. She just knew her experience, and inevitably conveyed that personal perspective through her story. And I, knowing nothing about dysphoria, read my own experiences in instead. With a narrative this abstract, audiences instinctively put themselves into the story. In fact, while Celeste's themes and conclusions may have rung false to me for my own struggles with mental illness, it read fabulously for plenty of other cis-straight people with no clear inroads to the trans community. And that's great! In fact, when trans Celeste fans explain what appeals to them about the game's narrative, their comments are almost always universal human conditions, rather than ultra-specific trans issues. In the words of Celeste modder Marshall H., Celeste is a game about the process of understanding who you are, and in turn, the process of learning to be empathetic to yourself. Celeste paints its story in broad strokes that invite anyone to relate to its emotional journey, regardless of the details. The fact that Madeline's emotional journey doesn't perfectly match mine shouldn't undermine her story in my mind. It's just a different perspective. The experience of climbing the mountain is so... It's like... No one believes I can do this, but I can fucking do this. And I need to do this because if I don't do this big scary thing, I don't know how to approach my life. I need to prove to myself that I can do this. You're like, I don't necessarily, this seems like it's gonna be really hard, but it's worth it. Cause on the other side, you find yourself. It's difficult to use the kind of abstractions Celeste relies on to clearly inform an audience what your allegory is meant to be allegorizing. Allegorizing? Uh, it's especially hard when Maddie herself did not yet understand the very struggles she was writing about. Moreover, it's not Maddie's responsibility to educate her audience. But the biggest hurdle to telling subtle stories about trans issues is awareness. I, like many people, was simply not aware of trans issues, and so had no way of reading dysphoria into Madeline's story. And right now is an important time to be aware of the struggles of people like Maddie. Gender dysphoria is a mismatch between your primary, perceived sexual characteristics and the person you feel yourself to be. It can mean feeling uncomfortable in your own skin, anxious interacting with other people, and depressed when you're alone with your thoughts. Two-thirds of people experiencing gender dysphoria report symptoms of depression and fully three-quarters report symptoms of anxiety. Suicide rates among trans youth are more than double the rates of their peers, with half of all trans youth having considered suicide in the past year, and nearly 20% attempted suicide in the past year. But it doesn't have to be this way. One of the biggest factors in suicide rates among trans youth is social support. Living with parents who support you, in a community where you feel welcome, and attending schools where your rights are upheld can make the difference between a difficult and confusing period in a child's life versus a harrowing, dangerous childhood, potentially ending in tragedy. Even the smallest gestures can make a world of difference. The other pillar of trans health is medical care. Doctors have worked for many years to establish clear treatment guidelines for gender dysphoria. These treatments can include therapy, vocal coaching, hormone treatment, and surgeries. These steps reliably improve health outcomes for trans people, and have been backed by major medical associations across the globe. And for trans children approaching puberty, puberty blockers are a fully reversible way to give doctors, patients, and guardians years more time to consider any potentially permanent decisions. You may have heard anti-trans talking points about people changing their mind after gender-affirming surgeries and wishing they could reverse course. 
almost without exception, this does not happen. To even begin transmedical treatment, you need to have experienced significant effects from multiple symptoms for at least six months, with the bar for children being particularly high. Once you do start care, there are many steps and other treatments before any irreversible changes, with the whole process generally taking years. This is not a thing people can enter into lightly. In fact, in a 2015 study of trans people in their years post-surgery, less than 0.5% of participants regretted their surgery. And of those who do experience regret, over 80% reported only external factors like pressure from family and social stigma. It's for all these reasons that the medical community has been unanimous and outspoken in its recommended care for trans people. The World Health Organization has said that they are committed to inclusive healthcare and equitable access for trans, gender diverse, and all other people. The American Medical Association called trans-related healthcare medically necessary, and efforts to deny that care a dangerous intrusion into the practice of medicine. The National Association for Social Workers urged all social workers to protect the rights, legal benefits, and privileges of people of all gender identities and expressions, including everything from honoring someone's self-identified gender identity to transgender inclusive healthcare access. The Endocrine Society and Pediatric Endocrine Society, the medical organization specializing in hormone research, said the framework for providing care is increasingly well established, that there is a durable biological underpinning to gender identity, and that medical intervention is safe and effective. And yet, despite the overwhelming consensus of specialists worldwide, lawmakers in the US have fought tooth and nail against the trans community's right to healthcare, or even to exist at all. The Equality Act, introduced in US Congress years ago, would add anti-trans protections into the Civil Rights Act, prohibiting anti-trans discrimination across the board. However, Congress has repeatedly failed to sign off on it. An early argument against trans rights involved boys and men masquerading as women to enter women's bathrooms and assault women. This argument has been largely abandoned because there is no evidence of trans equality laws producing these results. It turns out, sexual predators already know how to open doors. The other argument against the Equality Act is the idea that biologically male athletes will take over and dominate women's sports. If that isn't blatantly ridiculous enough, the legislators making these arguments can't even find a single example of this actually happening. But since the Equality Act was proposed and repeatedly struck down, the situation for trans Americans has gotten worse, not better. Much, much worse. In 2023, politicians across the US have pushed anti-trans legislation that limits or prohibits schools from discussing the topic of gender, bans books with explicit or implied transgender or gay themes, and, most damningly, denies crucial healthcare to trans children and adults. So far, 168 bills have been proposed targeting trans healthcare in the US, 20 of which have already passed and been signed into law. Bills like Wyoming's SF-0111 classifies gender-affirming care for minors, the exact kind of care that improves mental health outcomes and reduces suicide rates, as child abuse. Oklahoma's OKSB-129 threatens felony charges to anyone administering gender-affirming care to people as old as 26. Meanwhile, some states like Arizona are establishing precedent to ban books based solely on the use of pronouns. All of this despite the World Health Organization, the American Medical Association, the Endocrine Society, and more speaking out against this kind of legislation. And these bills aren't even popular among US citizens, not even the ones you're thinking of. A 2021 poll found the majority of Trump supporters in swing states approved of trans rights, and 50% of all Republicans and evangelical Christians supported the Equality Act. This wave of anti-trans legislation has been a transparently political move by people who stand to gain from stoking hatred and othering anyone they can. And how do the politicians pushing these bills defend them? We passed a law to protect the children in Arkansas, and I think that's what is important. Again, 
the medical community disagrees with you that well, that's not protecting all of the children. medical community who doesn't i don't have the name of that off the top of my head i know it's something that you don't have the name of the organization that, that off you're the getting top of my head oh okay the average citizen doesn't support anti-trans legislation because of some deep-seated beliefs they support these bills because of a lack of understanding They've been fed a narrative about imagined harms by vultures looking to capitalize on a poorly understood minority. The best way for us to stem that tide is to facilitate empathy and understanding. Like, I'll look back at, at some of my earlier memories from childhood and I'll think about, like, characters that I really, really was obsessed with. Like, I was obsessed with Peter Pan like you would not believe. And I was, and not the Disney version, but like the original, just like, I was obsessed. Any new media, Peter Pan wise, I was like, fuck yeah, Forever Boy, I'm here. Hook, oh my god, Forever Boy and also now I get to be Robin Williams, amazing. I love it, I want to do it. I knew what felt like me. I was just convinced that I wasn't allowed to do that, that I wasn't allowed to be that. Stories are a powerful tool for communication. Just knowing that someone out there understands the struggle you're going through, that you're not alone, that there is hope for things to get better, can help children and young adults better understand their own internal struggles, and to persevere despite adversity. Maddie isn't the only trans person telling their story in the game industry. If you want to support trans developers or trans positive stories, you can check out the recent Metroid-like gem, Unsighted, developed by Studio Pixelpunk's Fernanda Diaz, or Midboss's Cyberpunk VN 2064 read-only memories. There's also Rocket Adrift with their dinosaur dating game, and their upcoming Psychroma, which I am so excited for. Look at this, it looks crazy! And of course, there's none other than Celeste composer Lena Rain, whose phenomenal body of work continues to grow more impressive every year. If anything in this video came as a surprise to you, I highly recommend checking out the human rights campaign's Transgender and Non-Binary People FAQ. If you're the parent of a child who's questioning their gender, the HRC even has an extensive guide specifically for you. The biggest thing the trans community needs from us is understanding and safety. Certain politicians and hate groups have decided that the trans community is small and unsupported enough that they can be safely demonized and no one will stand up to help. Allies like me, and I hope, you, need to prove them wrong. You can make a world of difference just by making your social gatherings trans-friendly spaces. When you introduce yourself, even if gender doesn't matter to you at all, include your pronouns to signal to people around you that it's safe and acceptable to do so. If you're in a conversation and someone puts trans people down, speak up. All it takes is one person speaking up to change that conversation from one where anti-trans rhetoric is the unquestioned status quo to one where anti-trans comments met vocal opposition. We need to show both trans people who may be living in fear, and the less knowledgeable who would support trans rights but don't understand them, that trans people are welcomed. And they are supported. If you live in the US and want to do more, we need your help to push back against this anti-trans legislation. Contact your state and local leaders to tell them that trans rights are a voting issue for you and that you oppose anti-trans legislation. Support organizations like the National Center for Trans Equality and the American Civil Liberties Union who are working to stop or overturn these bills. And if you're struggling with mental health in any way, please seek help. If you're in the US, the suicide prevention hotline is just a phone call away, and mental health professionals with relevant specializations in your area can help you process the pain you're dealing with. If you're struggling with gender dysphoria or need trans care, translifeline.org has a crisis hotline, as well as a trove of information and resources for all aspects of trans experience. At the very least, reach out to trans communities who can help you understand what you're going through. Links to all of that are in the description. 
As a final note, to honor Maddie's wishes for fans to allow her to move on to new projects that better reflect who she is today rather than the struggles she lived through years ago, I'll be adding her upcoming game, Earthblade, to my wish list. Because if there's one thing I know for sure after playing and replaying Celeste, it's that Maddie is one hell of a skilled developer, and her next game is sure to be great.